This is Bishop John with a homily from Friar Doc for the fourth Sunday of Easter. Yeah, the first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. The responsorial verses are from Psalm 118, verses 1 and 8 and 9, 21 through 23, 26, and then 28 and 29. The epistle reading is from the first epistle of John. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And the Gospel reading is from the Gospel of John in chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. As always, I commend them to you highly. And for the fourth Sunday of Easter, the lessons describe the reality of our Messiah from several different perspectives. He is the reason we Christians can infect the world with a holiness and healing so many experience when we uh, pray in his name. He is the cornerstone of the world, its foundation as well as its king. We become his brothers and sisters when we learn in all humility to love him and to love those in the world around us. Uh, finally, our master willingly laid down his life for us. It was not a burden imposed on him. And an equally selfless life is our calling if we seek truly to be followers of the way. In the five verses from chapter 4 of the book of Acts, Peter explains to a bunch of critics once again just how the earlier healing of a cripple uh, took place. He invoked the name of our master, Jesus Christ, and the cripple was healed. That was it. He went on to tell them how monumentally wrong they had been, and finally, uh, how they could save themselves. Filled with the Holy Spirit, and so able to address his audience with forthrightness and clarity, verse 8, Peter addresses uh, their suspicion that a good deed done to a cripple was accomplished by some nefarious means, <laughs> verse 9. He says that instead, all the people of Israel should know that it was in the name of Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead, that the man was healed. Verse 10. Citing scripture, he tells them Jesus is the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Verse 11, which referenced Psalm 118, verse 22. The plain fact, he says, is that there is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. Verse 12. They've messed up big time, in other words, but they can still be saved. Peter is still singing the same tune, so to speak, here in chapter 4, as he was singing back in chapter 3 last week. They weren't practicing magic when the cripple was healed. There was no magic there, other than Peter's decision to act out of love, to stretch out his hand emboldened by the Holy Spirit. There was no extra power inherent in Peter's hands, nor is there in any Christian's hands. There was only his faith-filled prayer in the name of Jesus Christ that the cripple be healed. The, the miracle took place because of his invocation of the name of Jesus Christ. His message to the people in chapter 3 was that Jesus Christ, whom they had rejected, had been raised up by God and was now the cornerstone of the world. Faith in him and his name was now the only path of redemption and salvation available to mankind. The audience this time is different. Peter and those with him have been a, a, arrested for what amounts to uh, disturbing the peace and hauled before the high council of Grand Pubas, the priests, elders, and scribes. This would be something like being required to appear before a Senate Select Committee on something or other, I imagine. 
In any case, they are commanded to explain the trick, to explain how they'd heal the cripple. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit and not intimidated at all, verse 8 again, launches once more into the same argument, the same accusation and offer he's been making all, all along. He hasn't changed his tune even a little bit. He, remain, he reminds those around him who are questioning how on earth such a healing of a known cripple could take place, that they rejected Christ when he was with them, in effect betting on the wrong horse. This is not the kind of mistake anyone wants to make. We know Peter will offer to bless any who choose to believe, but here he's rubbing it in. They threw away, rejected, the cornerstone of the new world. This is the world in which God, through his Son, provides healing to cripples and to many others. Most importantly, the sins of all who believe in him are forgiven by Jesus Christ. Only believe they and we are told, and all the joy, the peace, the love, and the wonder you see in the Christians you've met are yours as well. Although we hear lots of accusations that the church is threatening all those who don't come to Jesus, as it were, with the wrath of God. The real story of the church has always been and continues to be what Peter presents to all of us in these few verses. The verses from Psalm 118 urge us to put our trust in God rather than in man, verses 1, 8, and 9 to understand how much Yahweh loves us and how faithful our Messiah is. Famously, they proclaim now how the builders rejected him, but he became the cornerstone, verse 22, and how we should respond to all this with all praise and thanksgiving, verses 21, 23, 26, 28, and 29. More than anything, we should approach him with tender hearts, with praise and thanksgiving. God is our Father. He loves us. He is merciful and He isn't going anywhere. Verse 1. We, sh we should put our trust in God rather than in mankind. Verse 8. Or in any of the princes of this world. Verse 9. Verse 8, by the way, is often called the exact middle of the Bible. Whether or not it's true, the verse here in one sentence describes the foundation of all scripture, it seems to me. Only God is constant in our lives. Only God is constant throughout history. All the governments and heroes of mankind fall down, go boom, as my little brother Bill would say. The psalmist gives thanks to God because he knows he has already answered his prayers and has already saved his behind, verse 21. He knows, therefore, it won't be any different in the future. The verses remind us that God is neither fickle nor unfaithful. He is instead constant in his concern for us, and his mercy endures forever, verses 1 and 29. We have a saying, if you feel far from God, guess who moved? that expresses some of the same constancy we see in the verses here describing our Abba. That we choose to hide from him doesn't mean our Abba has moved away. It means we have chosen to turn away. In verses 21 and 22, the psalmist blesses the cornerstone, the one who comes in the name of the Lord and will recognize the answer to his prayers when he sees it. It is, it is a prayer for the whole community, actually. This was written many centuries before Jesus came to town, so to speak. We should be so faithful. The psalmist gives thanks and praise to God, verses 21 and 28 again, and urges us to join him, verse 29 again. This is because, as he knows without a doubt, God is merciful and, in fact, takes care of those who call on him. Jesus Christ, our Messiah and risen Lord, the cornerstone of our world, also loves us and he also is not going anywhere. 
and neither has the Holy Spirit deserted us. God is here for us. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is all around us and offers us help if we ask. This is a good thing since we are often unfaithful hacks who very much need divine forbearance and protection while we try to get out of the messes we've made. We also insist on trying to figure out things for ourselves instead of listening for the still small voice of God to guide us. Eventually we run out of options and God is there as a last resort, a resort we should have chosen in the first place. Go figure. Our Abba grieves for us in our monumental ineptitude and invincible arrogance, but he doesn't want clever little robot toys marching in a straight line he has specified. He wants children who have chosen him and his way out of love for him. He wants the opportunities to, to sneak just a little wisdom into our thick skulls with his grace and the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge his gifts sometimes, and actually gifts, and, and sometimes we use them, but usually almost by accident. In any case, he abides, and he doesn't stop trying to reach out and touch us. He is, as we read over and over again throughout Scripture, faithful and constant. In the two verses from chapter 3 of the first epistle of John, we are reminded of the fact that as Christians we are in the world, but not of the world. Our relationship with God is one of children to their Abba, to their dad or papa as it were. The rest of the world doesn't know Christ and doesn't know us, verse 1. We don't know and can't predict where the Spirit will take us. We only know that we are God's children now, that we should commit ourselves as followers of the way every day, and that we shall be like him and will see him as he is uh, at the time uh, when it is revealed to us. Verse 2. We show we are God's children by following the commandments Jesus Christ gave us, don't you know? It isn't easy, and we're not always successful at it, but that's how it has to be. If we live moral lives, it is easier for us to allow ourselves to feel loved by our Abba. It is easier for us to reflect his love for us on into the world around us. When we know he loves us and we return his love, we change. We look at our brothers and sisters with empathy and, review, and view the world with a compassion. We think in terms of reconciliation, hoping all of us can return eventually to the arms of Jesus Christ. The glory and wonder of Christ fully revealed in the world, gathering all of us to him, is a comfort on which we can reflect and take heart. It is fuel for, our, for joy in our hearts, but until he returns, it also remains a mystery for us. It is simply enough for us to remember we are God's children and we should act like it. This involves identifying and confronting the standing stones of our lives, carving crosses on them and lifting them up for Christ to sanctify. This means confronting our own personal false gods and changing what is heathen and not focused on Jesus Christ into a holy offering. This reclamation program is a lifelong commitment, by the way, so get used to it. There isn't much of anything we can't turn into a false god that needs confronting. In fact, I think it's true that we're better off at creating false gods than we are at recognizing them for what they are. Go figure. In the reading from chapter 10 of the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus describing precisely who he is in terms his hearers cannot mistake. They can, under, they can misunderstand, or flat out not understand at all, where Jesus is taking them as he speaks, but they understand the characteristics of a responsible shepherd. They know what a good shepherd should be like, and Jesus takes advantage of that 
uh, common understanding is the basis for his discourse. Our Lord isn't just God's hired hand. He's the true shepherd and he is committed, not just concerned, like the pig rather than the chicken in the matter of ham and I told that one already. Jesus will lay down his life for us, verse 11. He and our Abba are one, John 10, 30. And it is through the Son that the Father has redeemed us. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Isaiah 43, 1. Jesus, our advocate, says to us, I know mine, and mine know me. Verse 14. It is clear from the Master's description of the difference between the concerns of the hired hand and those of the shepherd, verses 12 and 13, that he knows us. It is clear he knows us just as well as the Father knows him and he knows the Father, verse 15. So enough with our game playing, our facades, our half-truth, and our lies already. Nobody who matters is buying it. In any case, he will lay down his life for us, verse 15 again, and for others who will combine with us to form his whole flock, the sheep of one shepherd only, verse 16. The Father loves him because he will lay down his life in perfect obedience to him and take it up again, verse 17. Our Lord hasn't been coerced into the sacrifice that he will make, but, it, but does it freely because it is his Father's will, verse 18. Do we know him? Do we act like we know him? There, these are two sides of the same coin for followers of the way. If the first is true, the other must also be true. This isn't rocket science. It's just the way human beings are wired, and the Hebrews knew it. The word for faith in Hebrew, emunah, means acting faithful to God by following his commandments rather than having faith in God as we might translate the Greek word, pistis. If we say we know Jesus and it hasn't changed our lives and how we behave, we are posturing as Christians, certainly, but in the end, we're just liars. In some sense, our Lord establishes a pattern for the rest of us in what he describes here about himself. In the end, he didn't lay down his life because he had to. He chose to lay down his life. He was a child of God with free will, just like all the rest of us are in this regard. It was because of his free will that the Incarnation was completed perfectly, engendering a triumph no one around him could even imagine, I expect. His faith and faithfulness led to his horrible death on Good Friday, of course, but they also opened up the entire world to the fact of the resurrection the first glorious mystery of the res Rosary, the fact of the Ascension, the second glorious mystery of the Rosary, and the fact of the descent of the Holy Spirit, the third glorious mystery of the Rosary, on the ensuing, uh, that was on the ensuing uh, Pentecost. Despite all the prophecies, despite his own instructions, no one among his disciples, let alone his persecutors, expected any of this. We're not much different today, especially as the world unfolds around us in ways we don't expect and of which we don't approve. It's still true that we all see through a glass dimly, as St. Paul observed so long ago, 1 Corinthians 13:12. Yeshua ben Joseph was the cornerstone rejected by the Jews, but he nevertheless triumphed becoming the means by which all mankind can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Considering the prophecy in Psalm 118 was made centuries before the Master walked the earth, and, the, and there are over 300 others throughout the Old Testament, <coughs> it is easy to think that Jesus <coughs> didn't have any options, that this was essentially a done deal. In this case, however, <clears throat> I think our hindsight gets in the way of, re of the reality. 
He was not ever an automaton or a slave. What our Lord did for us was his choice. I don't think I really understand the magnitude of such love. Is there even one of us who does? It should be clear that neither are we slaves in the grand scheme of things. All of the steps of our lives, in fact, we take. We take. We choose each step of our journey and how we react to what happens in the world around us and how we respond to those in the world around us and how they act. We don't control the rest of it, but we choose to follow our master on the one hand or the demands and fears of our egos on the other. Our Abba is faithful. Through his Son he has provided for our redemption and holds his arms out to us. Unless we turn to him as the children we are, overcoming our whining, uh, our lives and our pride, we dally in eddies of wasted time and effort in pools that eventually begin smelling bad. In this blessed season of Easter, let us choose wisely. There is only the one choice for us if we really want to be followers of the way. In every small step, let us choose to make the world a little better for our having been here, and then act without fear. Let us remember always a bit of folk wisdom based on Scripture, Psalm 91 and 1 Corinthians 10:13, among others. The will of God never takes us where His grace can't keep us. Even in the darkest of nights, the reality is we're never alone. Oh, one step at a time, let us choose to be Christians, to respond to Christ's love, and to embrace the way, the truth, and the life. Let us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. God bless you and yours.